For the last 40 years, trucking firm Eddie Stobart has been delivering the goods that keep the UK running. But now the ambitious haulage company is looking to conquer road, rail and air. It's taken the bold step of investing in an airline. Just checking in the last three passengers for our first flight. Developing an airport for London. It'll be amazing, trust me. But its bread and butter will always be trucking. Very store about to stop for a day, you end up with no stock on the shelves. Their 3,000 drivers are on the front line, pounding the tarmac 24-7. Fine lines make a big difference. Delivering the essentials, no matter what the challenge. We've got a problem. Oh, they shut the bloody road because the white load again. Come on! Coming up, Stobart takes to the skies. The aircraft that's coming in is on approach, so we're just getting all to battle stations. But they could be grounded. All right, guys. It's not a shame. One driver heads to the wilds of Scotland, but it's a treacherous path. If you too much, you just fall over. And top trucker Mark Dixon is feeling rejected. Got one pallet refused, plus five cases. It's just one of those things, it's haulage. Stobart is always looking for new ways to compete in the deliveries market, and it's set its sights on a new target. Scotland's forest and timber industry. It's worth over 1.7 billion to the economy. To tap into this lucrative business, Stobart splashed out on its first log wagon so it can start transporting timber. It's exciting, it's a great bit of kit, it's really good, it's fantastic really. William's so pleased with his new lady, he's commissioned a photo shoot. This is like the creme de la creme of trucks. Official Stobart photographer and former truck driver Dave Mulholland has been sent up to Lockerbie to capture this rare beauty before she hits the road. But something like today, it's very special because it's our first timber truck. She's named after Laura Jane, who uh, I'm led to believe is a model and super fit. But there again, so is our timber truck. Laura Jane's on trial. And if she's a success, the company will invest in more. Boss William Stobart is her biggest fan. I would love to drive that truck and do that job, yeah. But there's only one man who gets to ride her all day. And that's 36-year-old Peter Grant. He's a proud New Zealander. Living in Scotland now 14 years, sir. Picked up a wee bit of the lingo. Deborah, good luck, bye-bye. The father of two is married to a Scot. He came to the UK for a holiday and never left. Everybody thinks I'm South African or Australian, God forbid. Stobart wouldn't trust just anyone with their new baby. Peter's been driving log wagons for other companies for the last five years. He's been with Stobart for seven months, hired in especially to drive Laura Jane. It's an exciting job. It gets the adrenaline rushing when you're heading up into the wood. After a late shift yesterday, Peter slept in his truck at a sawmill near Lockerbie in southern Scotland. A legally enforced nine-hour rest break means he and Laura Jane are about to start their day at 6 a.m. Starting later than he would have liked, Peter's already playing catch-up. From Lockerbie, they're travelling 17 miles up the M74. Then five miles along country roads through Moffat to Rayclou Forest to pick up a load of logs. From there, it's 50 miles south to a log train that's leaving from a Carlisle rail depot. This wood I've never been to before, so I'm just going to kind of work out where we're going to go. I've got my map here. It's, uh, it's not the best maps in the world. It's just the directions they give you is all you've got to go on, so you're going to make sure they haven't missed anything out. Peter can't afford to take a wrong turning. Once he's picked up the logs, he's got to get them on a train leaving Carlisle in less than three hours. It's supposed to be there and loaded for nine o'clock, so we're going to get up here, get loaded, get down, 
load the carriage before it leaves to go to Kronenspan. With time ticking, thankfully his hand-drawn map is spot on. It's us here at one of the woods. I'm going to take the next road end on the right, get up here now, and find this timber. Peter might be on the right track, but the forest's narrow dirt road can only fit one eight-foot-wide log wagon down it at a time. If you meet somebody, somebody's got to reverse to let the other person pass. And that could be lethal. If you get too close to the edge, then it slides off the road. We end up upside down, which we don't want that at all. The ditches are five feet deep either side. It's been boys hurt, seriously hurt, with wagons falling off roads. Every year, there are serious incidents involving log wagons tipping over. The boy I know, he came round the corner and fell over, and he got a ride in a helicopter. So it's, it's serious, like. Peter's fear of falling off the side could soon be realised when another vehicle comes straight towards him. And he'll reverse back for us, let us by. They have to reverse 300 feet back up the muddy, uneven track to let Peter's monster machine through. It's the problems with the woods, sir. There's no passing places up here. Traffic crisis over, he locates his logs. Get in here and get stuck in Ted. Huge piles are left along the track, ready for whichever haulier collects first. This is where Laura Jane comes into her own. Her tyres have extra puncture resistance and a special block tread for grip in challenging terrain. She's got her own elevating cab that controls an extendable grab for loading the timber. It's able to rotate 360 degrees, picking up logs with ease. The trailer's capable of holding 25 tonnes of solid timber. The high-strength aluminium log cradle is made up of bolsters that hold the wood in position. And a V8 500 horsepower engine makes light work of pulling this heavy cargo. Peter gets down to business. Pavers on. First, he has to lower Laura Jane's legs to stabilise her in the uneven ground. But even then, as he climbs into the crane's cab, it's a hell of a height when elevated. When you're up there and it tilts over a wee bit, your bum doesn't half grab the seat. With a train to catch, Peter's got to crack on. He uses Laura Jane's crane like an extended arm. The crane's grab lifts over a ton of logs at a time. And Peter's perfected his technique to manipulate the timber into position. To speed things up, Laura Jane's bolsters conveniently slide back to move the first full load to the rear of the trailer. In just 15 minutes, Peter's almost done. He tosses an imperfect log back onto the pile, as the train won't accept any logs over 10 feet. I've just left it. Somebody else can take that one. He carefully straps down the timber. Make sure it doesn't come off on the road. If it flew off and hit somebody, it would be fatal. Let's get out of here. Laura Jane's stuffed to the brim with 25 tonnes of chip pine logs. And it's just a wee bit on the rough side, bouncing about a bit. Now he's fully loaded, Peter's chances of tipping off the edge of the track are even greater than when he was empty. With it's being loaded now, it's a wee bit trickier now because holes in that in the road just mark you start to sway, and if it sways too much, you just fall over. The uneven path isn't just narrow. It's also slippery, and Laura Jane's struggling to find traction. It's clarty, it's quite wet, it sticks to the wheels, starts spinning. The light's flashing on the dash, so that it's losing power. Peter needs to gain back control, because if he doesn't, his wheels could slide off the track and he'll be over on his side. 
looking good at all. He's got to hold on for another 100 yards. But thankfully, he's soon off the wet road and onto firmer ground. Back on the Ashfeld. They've now got 50 miles ahead of them to reach the train at Carlisle before it leaves. Will Peter and Laura Jane make it in time? We'll find out after the break. Eddie Stobart's newest truck is on a mission. Laura Jane is Stobart's very first log wagon. And her Kiwi driver, Peter Grant, has just collected 25 tonnes of timber from a Scottish forest. Now he's heading south for a 9am train from Carlisle. It's 45 miles away, and Peter's got just under an hour to make it there. It's going to be tight. It wouldn't be a bugger if it's gone, eh? But it's not just the clock he's racing. Due to his legal driving hours, Peter had a late start, so other hauliers have been loading timber at the rail depot since 6am. Peter's hoping to get there before the train is full. And one of his competitors has the same idea. He's got a three metre chip on as well for the train. He's going to try and beat us. His rival's driving a truck with a 420 horsepower engine. But Stobart hasn't skimped on its new lady. Laura Jane's kitted out with a V8 500. Power of the V8. I can catch him up this hill here. Ah, oh, there he goes. The other log wagon is left eating Laura Jane's dust. We've got 25 tonne of timber on, and it just rummed up the hill. Laura Jane's doing a good job so far, like, pull on past, no bother at all. Finally, he reaches Carlisle, and the rail depot is almost in sight. Around the corner, through a dip, and that's us. Peter's made good time. But whether the depot will find room for his load on the train is another matter. All of Peter's efforts to make the deadline could be for nothing. We'll try and see if we can bluff our way onto the train. Hopefully, fingers crossed. If there are no carriages left for Peter to load, he'll be forced to put his logs to one side and that'll cost the freight company money to get it reloaded. Let us in here, we're just going to load one of the last carriages for the train will be ready to go. With the train waiting to leave, he gets straight to work. But Peter can't just slam the logs in. It's vital he gets them in perfect position. Like a game of Tetris, he has to fit the logs in neatly. Logs are loaded, but the pressure's not off. There are strict safety regulations on how the timber is positioned, and yardman Glenn casts his scrutinising eyes over Peter's work. Making sure the wood's on the outside of the pins. Protruding branches can catch electricity wires, bridges, or other trains. The, the train will not move if anything's sticking out either side of the carriage. Just that everything's all right, Peter, that you've loaded on the train. It's in spec with the pins, and you're free to go. And that's us, back into the woods. The newest addition to the fleet has completed a challenging run, and she's done her bosses proud. <laughs> Delivering timber isn't where Stobart's bold ambitions end. It's now reaching for the sky and looking to transport passengers. We're moving into air. We just wanted to develop the airport. There'll be flights basically going all, all over the world. The plan started in 2008, when it bought Southend Airport in Essex for £21 million. Stobart has invested a further £30 million to expand the airport in time to accept large passenger planes for London's 2012 Olympics. Control towers done, they're on building a new terminal, runways getting extended at the moment. As well as a new terminal, 
They're even building their own railway station right next door. Southend Airport is a 40-minute train ride to Stratford Station, 36 miles away in East London, a stone's throw from the Olympic Stadium. Private planes already use the airfield, and in the summer, a charter airline is based here. And when you've got planes, you need fire trucks, which have to be able to reach a landing aircraft within two minutes. So Snowbart employs a team of 23 firemen to be on call for any incident, any time at the airfield. That's an actual shower, isn't it? Yeah. We're really the heart of uh, the airport, really, to be honest with you. Fast. Furious. And fun. It's like being a little kid again, I suppose, really, playing with a little bit of water. <laughs> it is like a big family. That's why they live, you know, laughing and joking. Immature children. But obviously, there's a serious side of the job as well. And with up to two and a half thousand incidents a year at busy airports like Gatwick, the South End fire crew has been training hard, ready to take on bigger planes. Good, mate. I want them drains covered up. And I want all this area bundled off, yeah? It's just to keep them on their toes, cos I want to get them used to this sort of size aircraft, this sort of instant. Bigger planes means the lads are going to need a bigger truck. The new vehicle's coming today. The one that comes in, we'll do a bit of training on it. Dave, anything to add? No. No? OK. Greenwich, then. Greenwich, then. Fully duties, full out. <laughs> We've been waiting a long time for this to happen now, so, uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, can't wait to have a little play with it, so, yeah, it should be good. But they'll have to be patient, because their new fire truck is 340 miles away at Stobart's Carlisle Airport. And it's not designed for public roads, so it's going to have to go on the back of a low loader. Transporting it is veteran trucker 56-year-old Ian Wilson. On this job, you just take it off with the smooth. No nonsense, Ian usually transports machinery for Stobart Rail and he's been driving these low loaders for 26 years. Once you get in the truck in the morning, you're your own boss. When I'm on my own, I'll not fall out with anybody, will I? Ian and his truck, Lily Jean, are taking on this 18-ton load. It's a hefty weight, but the low loader is built for the job. That way, further forward. At a push, it's capable of pulling up to six double-decker buses. That's it. Get it chained on now. But if this heavy beast fell off on the motorway, it could cause a major catastrophe. So Ian's making sure it's secured for the ride. Just put these ratchets on. Once these are on, it'll not go nowhere. And that's what's loaded now with that big monster fire engine. Once loaded, they're ready to head south. From Carlisle, Ian's driving 340 miles down the motorway, all the way to the airport in Essex. Once delivered, he's got to turn round and drive the old fire truck all the way back up again. Certainly different, that thing on the back. And everybody's having to be stared as they go past, cos it's not every day that Stobart's carry a, a fire engine. After eight hours turning heads, Ian arrives with his special cargo. The quicker we get these and swapped over, the better it'll be for everybody. And fireman Steve can't wait to get his hands on her. There is a new uh, fire engine, looking lovely as ever, nice and shiny. There's more to her than her gleaming red coat. This custom-made hottie is made by fire truck manufacturer Chubb. Three firemen can fit in a cab that's fitted with all the mod cons. Her tank holds a whopping 2,200 gallons of water, 
enough to fill 120 bathtubs. She pumps out 1,000 gallons a minute and can reach her target from as far away as 50 feet. She's got her own retractable floodlights for nighttime incidents. And fully loaded, she weighs over 28 tonnes. Brand new, this flashy babe cost over half a million pounds. And as Ian untethers the beast, the firemen are just itching to have a play. I can't wait for us to get onto the ground, actually. They're like kids in a sweet shop. Uh, fair happy with it, with the new machine. Yes. Fantastic, lovely and clean, yes, nice machine. Will Carlisle Airport miss this one? I think they will, there's some tears when I brought it away. To soften the blow, the firemen at Carlisle Airport are going to receive one of South End's old fire trucks. But as Ian loads it up, he notices a problem. At nearly nine and a half feet wide, the fire truck's wheels are teetering on the edge of the low loader's deck. It's all wider, isn't it? Yeah. Ian decides it should be OK, but he's more concerned about the truck's height. As long as it's less than 16 foot. A load that exceeds the legal height limit won't fit under many bridges and needs a special permit to travel on public highways. Will you make jump up off top if I give him the tape measure? Just then it's safer if I measure it now, isn't it? If it's more than 16 foot, I won't be able to carry it. It's too high. If it is too high, he's stuck down south until he can get a special permit. And that could take up to three days. You all right there, yeah? Fifteen two, so we're all right. Yeah, I was a little bit concerned about the height, but we've got it measured now and it's OK. Ian can hit the road and leave the fire team to drool over their new toy. Yeah, it's very nice. Very nice indeed. This is going to be the first one to drive it. Oh, me. Blue bombers drive today, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Job done. Coming up, top trucker Mark Dixon is feeling homesick. It's not nice not being your own truck. It's, I miss it. It's just not the same. And can Eddie Stobart conquer the skies? Just checking in the last three passengers for our first flight. Eddie Stobart is one of the most iconic haulage companies in Britain. Part of its appeal is that it names its trucks after girls. It was an idea thought up by William Stobart's late brother, Edward. And that has stuck right from 75. And it was pop stars, it was girls in the charts that you fancied at the time, and it went on from there. Now, any girl can have their name on one of the famous lorries, but with a three-year waiting list, that means having a bit of patience. That is, unless you work for Stobart. How about the only Stobart driver who's got two trucks with his half name on it? Oh, I'm well proud of that. I am absolutely well proud. Former carpet fitter Mark Dixon is one of Stobart's top truckers. That's all I know now. I mean, I could probably fit the on carpet. I don't know if it'd be straight. It might be wavy. He's been driving for Stobart for 10 years. Now he's got the most bling truck in the fleet, and it's named after his daughter, Phoebe Grace. It carries my daughter's name on it. At the end of the day, it's, uh, I don't like looking crap. Clean truck means a good day. 33-year-old Mark's normally a happy chappy, but he's not so happy today. I can't film that. It's not my lorry. <laughs> His beloved Phoebe Grace is out of action. So it's kaput at the minute. It's in, it's in hospital getting fixed. So the driver of this lorry, he's off sick, so I've borrowed it. <laughs> Trampers like Mark eat, sleep and work in their trucks Monday to Friday. At the end of the day, my truck's my home. It's not nice not being your own truck. It's, I miss it. It's just not the same. Mark's having to do without all his home comforts. 
obviously there's all your things as well then. I have stuff in my truck like you have in your house. And to move all that into another lorry, it, isn't, it, it takes forever. So you, you then go to the bare minimal, you, you just take what you need to take. And you pack one at time, open your cupboard and you forgot something. So uh, hopefully they'll fix it this week and I'll get it back. He's just arrived at a factory in Somerset and is being loaded up at one of the biggest fruit drink manufacturers in the UK. Gerber Juice imports over 80,000 tonnes of purees, pulps and concentrates from around the globe to produce over 2 million gallons of drinks a week. Basically got a lot of juice today, bit of a juicy day. On board Mark's trailer is 26 pallets of orange juice destined for a London wholesaler. Okay. <laughs> He's nearly at the maximum load he can carry, but that doesn't bother him. I like heavy loads, mate. I like, I like my truck to work. And uh, when you pull in stuff like this, your, your truck works. That's a fact man's in the garage now. <laughs> Mine's worked a bit too hard. From Bridgewater, Mark's travelling 150 miles to Hemel Hempstead for his first delivery to a drinks wholesaler. To avoid all the traffic on the M4 and all that, I'm taking a scenic route across the 303. Uh, it just makes it more interesting, a bit more fun, a few more hills. A bit of stone ends to see. Getting out and seeing the countryside is one of the perks of being a truck driver. Bit of a uh, misty day today. Just went past stone ends and I blinked and missed it. After a hassle-free journey, Mark and Olivia Grace arrive at their delivery point on time. That's the gate. We're here. <laughs> he backs onto the loading bay. So, like, our fate booking, we've got here at 8.35. Can't fold that, can we? <laughs> Mark's feeling smug, but there's a problem with some of his load. They're picking that up. Leave you there, knackered. The juice cartons have been damaged, and the company won't accept them in that state. I'll tell you, that one's just all leaking, yeah? Yeah, I think it's this one's leaking. It's gone all the way through, but I'll it. Oh, nice. We should reject the whole pallet, thank you very much. It's what the haulage industry calls a shot load, and it means Mark's going to have to take the rejected goods to the nearest Stobart depot. You're not going to pay for something that's broken. It's just one of them things, it's haulage. So I have to ring it through to our Stobart driver line, and they then sort out with a customer. Hi, uh, it's Mark Dixon. I've got one pallet refused, plus five cases. Mark heads to the returns depot at Averley near the Dartford crossing to drop off his rejected stock which means heading 50 miles around the M25 at rush hour. I envy people who live down here because they're in the capital of England, but I could not do this every day, and it must be so stressful. Well, I've got to watch out for the bikers because they just caught up on you, and if you don't see them and just move that little bit, you'll end up knocking them. Soon he's out of the traffic and arrives at the depot to drop off his rejected juice. Uh, we're going here now and get the pallets taken off. Just one, it's on this side. I'm all juicy. So what I'll do now is that'll get put on a trailer, take it back to where it's come from, i.e. this will go back to Bridgewater, along with some other pallets, probably. Just one more job to do. Doing clips up, it just seems to go on forever. It's like one, then another one, then another one. But boss William Stobart is quite particular about how the curtain side trailer straps look. See, this is a Stobart thing, tucking all the. A lot of, you, you'll get a lot of people just, just clip them up like that, and that there blows everywhere. And it's absolute pet hate. Strapped up and ready to go. Ready to rock and roll. Mark can head back to his HQ in the Midlands. Cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. And most importantly, he'll be back to pick up his beloved Phoebe Grace. At Stobart's South End Airport, the fire team is preparing for the arrival of its first daily passenger service in 20 years. With so few flights a day, the fire team is trained to do more than respond to emergencies. We're basically firemen. That's our actual main job. But we're uh, baggage handlers. Marshallers of aircraft. We do fueling. 
And they even carry out pest control, clearing the runway of birds who play havoc with the plane's engines. No, no, it's not going too well at the moment. I think I might have to get the gun out. Job done. The multi-talented fire team multitask to keep the airport running. It's just like Mr Ben, actually. When I was little, we used to walk through a wardrobe, come out, and we come out in a different uniform. And with Stobart's first passenger plane from Waterford Island just minutes from landing, their various skills are going to be put to the test. Looking forward to it today, actually. Everyone's a little bit uh, sort of jumpy, but uh, yeah, it'll be good, it'll be good. It's supposed to be in a 5-2, I believe. 5-9. Five, five, five to nine. Oh, 5 past. 5 past 9. <laughs> Get it right. Well, if I'd known it's five past nine, I would have turned up an extra ten minutes late. Stobart has even bought a stake in Ireland's Air Arran, so there's a lot riding on today being a success. Everybody's waiting in anticipation, really, because this is the first passenger flight into Southend. The company reckons if it can handle pallets, it can handle passengers. It, it's all about transportation, moving goods from A to B. Um, and if you can move passengers from A to B, it's the same thing. It's a big milestone for Stobart so they want to make it a memorable occasion for their first ever passengers. We're excited about this being the future, really. It's going to really put Southend on the map. The public face of Stobart Air is the ground crew. You look good for the morning. Oh, well. Fireman Chris Hill's girlfriend, Amy, is one of Stobart Air's 17 check-in staff. Right now, we're just going through the checking system, just checking it works, because it's the first time we've gone on the live system. Just getting, um, making sure the printers are working. 21-year-old Amy Such has been working at the airport for five years. I woke up with major butterflies and a bit nervous, but nothing would work, but you come in and everything's working, so that's really good. If it all goes smoothly with Air Aaron, other airlines might follow suit, and more airlines means more income. The first passengers arrive at check-in, and they're familiar faces to Amy. Do you need another one? It's her mum and dad. You're a bit early. <laughs> I thought everyone was going to be here, but it's very quiet. So you get first pick of the seats. They're off on the return flight to Waterford. Amy's first check-in goes off without a hitch. Thank you. Okay. Have you checked it fits in the baggage cage? Have you? That will fit in. I don't want to be the one whose parents it doesn't. All right, check it. My first passengers were my parents. I made them get up really early and come in. <laughs> Maybe a little bit too early, but they got the best seats in the plane, so that's good. The rest of the passengers are coming thick and fast. Very exciting. It's my first flight ever. Good morning, check-in. <laughs> Just checking in the last three passengers for our first flight, and then that's it. As it's the start of a new venture for Stobart, they've laid on the entertainment and a bit of a spread. But not everyone's able to enjoy the hospitality. Uh, we're just getting ready. The aircraft that's coming in is on approach, so we're just getting all to battle stations now. South End's firemen take up their various positions around the airport. Amy's boyfriend, yeah. Chris, is on fire duty, so heads to the truck. Didn't have Houston to show up. The flight is only minutes away. And fireman Steve gets into position on the tarmac to marshal it in. Got my two bats, uh, ear defenders, uh, safety glasses and my gloves. As the plane approaches, Chris and the rest of the firemen head toward the runway and are poised and ready for action should there be an emergency. Flies in my stomach. Once it's safely on the ground, the firemen have got another important task. 
They're christening the aircraft in a traditional airport firemen ceremony with a water cannon salute. It's a custom airport fire departments the world over perform. Fire service giving us a traditional salute, which is a great welcome. Uh, from where I was standing, it looked really impressive. They've welcomed it in. It's just a tradition, and it's a bit, you know, a little bit of playing about as well. So it's good. Fun over. It's back to work. And for Amy and the check-in crew, things aren't running so smoothly. Did we get that printer working? No. No, it wasn't. So what are we going to do for the appointed person? Amy's nightmare has come true. The check-in printer's not working. So she can't give the air crew details on the passengers and the weight of their baggage. The appointed person, don't they need the load things that print out from there to give to the flight crew? The load sheets are needed to calculate how much fuel to put in the plane. They're stored on the ground crew's hard drive, so without the printout, the air crew can't proceed. Right, so what can we do about me? I need to think about this for a minute. Hmm. The load sheets that need to be given to the crew are not going to be printing, so we need to think of a manual way we can do it. Over on the runway, her boyfriend Chris has swapped his fireman's uniform for a baggage handler's. So as soon as we've done one job, we're straight on to the next. He's poised and ready to put the bags in the hole. But until Amy can give the crew the information they need, everything's on standby. But she's just had a brainwave. I want to see if there's a way we can get it to send to another printer. She's asking the airline's Dublin office to print out the load sheets and fax them through. But they need to hurry. They've only got 25 minutes to have the flight loaded, boarded, and ready for takeoff. Just waiting for the load sheets, they've not come through. So as soon as they're through, I can tell the fire crew where they need to put the bags and speak with the uh, pilot. All the baggage handlers can do is wait. Coming up, will Stobart's first flight make its delivery on time? I've started boarding yet. Oh, then okay. Security check, check. As the team struggles with the aircraft. All right, guys. It's not shy. Stobart's South End Airport is waiting for its first daily passenger flight to take off. It was all going so well, but the plane's departure has been thwarted by a broken printer. The printer isn't working, but I want to see if there's a way we can get it to send to another printer. The air crew is waiting for a printout, giving details about the passengers and their luggage. With the clock ticking, fireman come baggage handler Chris wants to find out from his girlfriend Amy what's causing the delay. Sorry, I can't load it yet because I don't know um, the what? amount of bags. Don't know the amount of bags? No. Oh. As soon as I get them, oh. I can load. The passengers are still in the departure lounge, enjoying the free refreshments. But Amy needs to get them boarded if the flight's to take off in time. Where's um, Claire? The pressure's on the airport crew. Stobart has invested in this airline, so there's a lot at stake if they get it wrong. Amy gets the information to come through on their old fax machine and races to get it on the plane. It all happened so quick, and because the printer's not working, we had to go get a fax, so it's just a bit rushed, but it's OK. Under Amy's supervision, the fireman slash baggage crew get the plane loaded. Yeah, just observing, so I can sign it off, just to make sure it's all secured, then in the hold, and the right number of bags are on. It also gives Amy a chance to give her verdict on Chris's performance. He did a very good job, I'm very proud. Well, I told him. <laughs> The fuel is all done now, all the bags and that are on, so yeah, it's all going well. Yeah. That is the last one. But there's one thing missing. The passengers. Are they not started boarding yet? No, they're not. OK. Check, check. All right, OK. But soon they get the green light. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pre-boarding announcement for the Air Aaron flight. 
and the Stobart Air check-in crew finally board their first passengers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. The pilot gets ready to take to the skies. Well, I feel for really well. And the fire crew secures the hold for takeoff. No, it's not a bad little fly. I hope they're all like this. Nice. But they've spoken too soon. They can't close the door. It's an unfamiliar aircraft for these firemen. It's an unfamiliar aircraft for these firemen. Once again, takeoff time is in danger of slipping behind schedule. There you go, I think they clicked then. Chris and the lads are still desperately struggling with the latch. The 25 minute turnaround is fast running out. But finally, they get the knack. That's the one. Just in time. No problem with that door. There's a little latch we didn't know about. Backside of everything done, so I can now go and warm up. <laughs> and in true Stobart style, some plane spotters have turned up to see the aircraft off. I can relax now because all the worry and all the is it going to go right, and it did, so I'm over the moon. The plane taxis to the runway, and the team is rewarded with some well earned cake. My dietrician wouldn't want you to see this. <laughs> Everybody's happy, the management are happy, and that's what we want. Air Aaron are happy, which is the main thing, so uh, Luton Airport, watch out. As Stobart takes to the air, let's not forget the 3,000 truckers who are the driving force behind the iconic haulage company. Each one a character. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Mark and his stole by a truck. <laughs> Over the last eight weeks, they've taken us the length and breadth of Britain. Ready, willing, and able. From Britain's far north... The Welsh have arrived at John O'Groats. ..to Land's End. I could have done with a beach and a surfboard. I've ended up with a bit of grass, some sheep and the sun. <laughs> and beyond our shores. Grass version there is just complete bog. If you go into that, it's game over. The path hasn't always run smoothly. There's the bull there. That's the bloody thing that's holding us up, look. What's that? A gunshot. Mishaps have happened along the way. <laughs> sake. But with grit and determination... I'm sweating like a glass blower's ass. Eddie's army takes it all in its stride. First time today, I can put the shades on. We've been invited behind the scenes for key moments in the Stobart calendar. Life is uh, top of the box at the moment, it really is. As they celebrate their 40th anniversary along with celebrity fans. When I'm on tour, I count Stobart trucks. I swear to God. And take on an airline. As we say goodbye, Stobart will continue day and night, 24-7, delivering and delivering and delivering. There's a truck wheel, stop moving. Everyone suffers. Whatever the weather, whatever the challenge. We can do some serious ice road trucking now. <laughs> so next time you're on the motorway, remember to look up and give the guys in green a wave might just make their day. <laughs>